He's a three-time classic qualifier and a Bassmaster winner that you just don't seem to hear much from outside of the events. Well, not today. That all changes. Today, we get inside the mind of Mullins. David Mullins, that is. This week on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Well, it looks like we're going to do this again. It's the middle of the week. You've made it here. It is Wednesday. Happy hump day, one and all. Welcome to the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. I am Dave Mercer, and uh, thank you. First of all, before we get into anything, we surpassed 90,000 subscribers on YouTube earlier this week. When we started this podcast, we had 35 thousand youtube subscribers so we're at ninety thousand ten thousand away from a hundred thousand which seemed impossible at one time but because of you guys um <laughs> you blow me away every week this show grows every week subscribers grow every week so right now i just want to say thank you to all of you um for making the little show that could something pretty freaking cool so thank you all the subscribers if you haven't subscribed now's your opportunity we won't hold it against you i'm not going to point you out in front of the classroom or anything like that but go ahead and hit subscribe and they also say that you should hit the dingy thing so that you get alerted when we post something but uh, let's keep this growing let's get it to a hundred thousand because at a hundred thousand oh we get a youtube play button and i'm certain like the closer we get they're going to stop giving those out um at some point and usually in my life it's like the day before I get to it. So help us get to 100,000 real quick and uh, so we can get that play button, which really doesn't mean anything, but it kind of means you win the internet for that day. Um, so help us win the internet for that day. This week, though, before we go any further, has been um, a tough one. Um, most of you must know by this point, I mean, you can't turn on social media without seeing somebody talking about it but we lost ray scott this week the founder of bass as i always called him and uh bob cobb they are the chickens that laid the egg and thank god they did um it's tough to see ray pass but man you know you hear a lot of people talk and especially as people get older you hear a lot of people talk about legacies and and you know, wanting to leave their mark on the world. And, and to be honest, I always say that a lot of that stuff is life goes on. People, you know what I mean? People are always going to think, people from my generation are always going to think Michael Jordan's the best. People from today's generation are probably always going to think LeBron James is the best. And, and people before me, there's a bunch of people that think somebody else is the best. Um, so legacies are kind of a weird thing. But, man, you want to talk about a legacy. I mean, Ray Scott took his dream from the desk of an insurance salesman and went out to the world and feverishly pitched it and got laughed out of offices and, and told it would never happen. But he never took no for an answer. He was a fearless promoter and and a, an incredible salesman. But overall... He was a great American dreamer and he followed his dreams and what started on an insurance salesman's desk is now a worldwide industry. I mean, he literally created competitive fishing for the most part, the way we see it. He invented things like the kill switch and, you know, live wells, all these different things that have just made this industry, um, and, and, and more important than that, more important than an industry, what a legacy. Just think of every single one of us that at some point, whether we were alone and we were a kid on a boat just fishing or we were in front of people, we've all pretended to win the Bassmaster Classic. We've all talked through fish catches on the water. So for every individual on earth, that has ever experienced that, has ever done that. It's because of Ray's dream. Ray planted his dream in all of us and it has continued to grow and it will 
always continue to grow. It's amazing. Amazing what Ray Scott has done for the industry, for the fish. I mean, when this started, the the fish du jour, I don't know if that's the right term, but but like the the glamour fish at the time was trout. Everybody talked about trout fishing, and now bass fishing is everything. I mean, it's literally 60 to 80% of all fishing sales are directly a part of bass fishing. Um, and that was all because... Ray Scott had a dream and he followed that dream and 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 that dream never changes. You know what I mean? And, and you just see different people chasing that dream, but it all happened for all of us at some point, sitting on our knees, looking up at a TV and watching this amazing man sell us his dream. And, and there's people that will never get a chance to meet Ray Scott. I consider myself so lucky, so honored to be able to bask in what was Ray Scott and be able to spend time from him and learn time with him and be able to call him a friend. It was an amazing man, an amazing legacy. Uh, and, and you think of those special moments you've spent with your family, with your friends, with so many people that all came from Ray Scott's dream. So, thankfully, I told him many times how thankful I was for him and everything that he had done. So I don't feel like, I'm not one of those people who when someone passes, they're like, oh, I should have said this, I should have said that. Ray Scott knew exactly how I felt. And um, and I think Ray knew how many, many people felt. Um, because what he did was amazing. And, and it's just uh, ins inspirational. Um, it's amazing. But this week it sucks. And it's going to suck for a while. Because losing people hurts. Especially amazing people. And, and Ray had an incredible life. 88 years old. Um, man, the things that he experienced and did in his lifetime. It, it's it literally, you hear people say storybook life. And, and that's. That's what Ray Scott had. So um, thank you, Ray. Um, growing up, my mom used to always say to me, I, I don't know, I, I guess I cried a few times when we left a vacation or after a bad movie, and she'd be like, well, you know what? If you cry after a vacation, that just means it was a really good one. Or if you cry at the end of a movie, that just means it was a really good one. Man, what a movie the life of Ray Scott was. So thank you, Ray. Thank you to the Scott family for allowing him to give his all to this industry. And um, he will always be the chicken that laid the egg. And I'm so thankful for Ray Scott. But uh, thoughts and prayers are, as Pat McAfee says, T's and P's with all his families and family and friends. Because right now it sucks. But... Um, that man will be being honored for generations to come, and he deserves it. So, thank you, Ray. Um, I don't know how that sounded, if it was awkward, if it was weird, if it was whatever. I, I, I just needed to say something. Um, because this one really caught me off guard. You know, there's a lot of times where I have a direction where I want to talk about something, whatever, but I was just, I didn't catch me off guard because Ray's been getting older and he's been in bad health, but, but it's just like, you know, how do you sum up a man as amazing as Ray Scott? You, you just can't. So now I've got to transition. I told you it's equally, awkwardly honest fishing podcast. Now I need to transition into our guest this week. And, uh, Total honesty, me and David recorded this before Ray passed. So we do not address it at all in this interview. It's not that we wouldn't have, but this was recorded before Ray passed. Um, and I'm thankful that uh, I was able to record this part and, and give Ray a bit of a tribute. And I don't even know what I did, but let's move on. See, I keep going back. I'm weirdo that way. 
David Mullins is um, in contention once again for Angler Year. Came very close to winning it just a few years ago. Um, at the very last event, Clark Wendlet chased him down and took that title from him. Um, but he's in the thick of things again here this week. But he's a dude you don't hear a lot from. I mean, really, away from the events, you just don't hear a lot from Mullins. I mean, he is a... A dude who just likes to go back to Mount Carmel, Tennessee and, and live a very, very simple life. But uh, that life is surrounded by the outdoors, whether it be um, whether it be through hunting in the marsh or, or it be through chucking a crankbait. Um, he's addicted to the outdoors and um, he may just be your angler of the year. We'll see how it all shakes out at the end of the season. But what he is guaranteed to be is this week's guest. So let's bring him in right now, David Mullins. David Mullins, look at us go. We are we are podcasting together. Does, does, does that excite you? You know you finally made it when you're on Dave Mercer's podcast. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Mercer knows my name. <laughs> sure, that's it. That's it. But I mean this in general, this conversing into a Zoom camera is this something you enjoy like, i mean there's some people who enjoy podcasts and the social media is that part of fishing that you enjoy or or is it just a necessary evil no i mean i don't think i don't enjoy it but like uh i know you've made the remark several times it's like once i leave a tournament i like go hide in the mountains you know and uh it's just i you know i got a little farm here that, that keeps me so busy and ever since we've got done with Chickamauga, I've dug drainage ditches and planted trees and sprayed fields. And, you know, there's something to do every day. And it just, it, it occupies so much of my time. And I bought this, bought this farm just for duck hunting. And you'd think that would be real simple, but it's like never ending. There's something, uh, there's something to do. And if you, if, if you know anything about farming, it's like something breaks every day you're farming. So that's, that's what I deal with usually when I'm home. There's a lot of frustration, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of work. But that's also a passion of yours too, right? Like I like I know some people who are like, I got to be on the farm because something's going to go wrong. But that's also where you want to be, correct? Oh, yeah, I mean, I love. Uh, I, I don't know why. Like nobody in my family fishes or duck hunts, so don't ask me why this is something that that's that's been like instilled in me to do. But uh, yeah, duck hunt man is just uh, I love it. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why I love it. I mean, some people are fanatics about deer hunting and all this kind of stuff, but uh, you know, I'd crawl across a bean field naked to shoot some mallards. You know, that's just how intense I am about duck hunting. And uh, you know, got to go with Jake Latondras, uh, which is you know one of our great cameramen at Bass this this winter, and uh, you know, got to go up there and hunt his place, and just had a ball, and got to you know spend time with other elite anglers, and that's something it, that that we don't ever get to do. I mean, it, yeah. People talk about, you know, well, how is so-and-so or how is, uh, how is Lee Livesey or how is somebody else? And I'm like, man, you know, I really can't tell you because the only time we see each other now, we used to have meetings, but the only time we see each other now is in weigh-ins. And you don't get a chance to really know people. And, uh, yeah. and that, that was a cool deal with, uh, with getting to go out there and just spending some time with, with uh, other league anglers and seeing Patrick Walters hit – Bill Lowen in the face with an ice ball, which was really interesting. So well, we won't well, talk about that any farther, but it was a uh, it was good. So he is nicknamed the Iceman now. So wow, uh, so we're not going to talk about it, but you will confirm that he did hit Bill Lowen with. I mean, how can you hit Bill Lowen with anything? That's like throwing. Uh, dude, it was it was so funny, and I'll go ahead and tell you. So anyway, we were packing. <laughs> whoop, we were packing up all the all the decoys and stuff, and everybody's helping and. And Bill's over there just by himself minding his own business. And he is working. You know, he's, he's wrapping up decoys and stacking them. And he, he's all. And for some reason, Patrick just out of nowhere picks on Bill. and's like, I'm going to hit Bill with a, with a snowball. Well, he, so he packs this snowball. And it, it's not a snowball. It's ice. And he's trying to hit Bill in like the midsection or probably the groin area or something. But Patrick been up there drinking some bush light with Lee for the last hour and his aim wasn't very good. And instead of hitting him in the midsection, he hits him right. I mean, like right in the eyeball. And it was like the most, everybody just hushed. I mean, 
I thought Bill was going to kill it. But uh, we got through that. We paid Patrick back in other ways, and uh, everything's good now. But it was a, it was a, it was an awesome time. I really enjoyed it out there. The Iceman. The, the Iceman. Man. You can't throw stuff at Bill Owen. That's like throwing stuff at the Easter Bunny. You That's can't right. do that. It, I'm telling you, it was classic. Poor Bill. <laughs> Poor Bill. Yeah, so, I'm so glad he's got, okay. Yeah, but I've got to spend some time with other people. And like I said, it's uh, something that the – the public don't realize we don't get the chance to talk very much, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, the actual social get to talk, have a conversation about something other than, you know, what's in front of you and that sort of thing. When did, when did this like duck hunting for you? Like when I hear you talk about it and like, you've already said, nobody in my family fished or duck hunted. So how I end up like, when did the first, cause it's one of the most amazing things I find about people in general, like you're born, and it doesn't matter what somebody shows you in life. There is this cer- yeah. There's certain things that you were going to do. Like, I, and I feel, you know, I see it with my own kids. There's certain stuff that that was not something I taught them, but they came that they came pre, you know, installed with certain things that they, that they have to be part of. And I feel like, and hunting is fish and fishing is definitely that for you. When did you first start feeling that? Uh, like, uh, I, I, the, I always like, being in the woods and stuff. But I think the first time I went duck hunting, I was 13 years old and like, we didn't shoot anything, but like, it was the fact of being on the water, you know, I was like being on the water and just, just the whole formality of all of it. And then, um, when I was about, uh, 16 is when I really 16, 17, somewhere in there is when I really started getting into it and starting learning how to decoy and learning places to go. And it just, it just escalated from then. And now bought a farm just for duck hunting. So I, I don't know, if, but I, I agree with you. It's instilled in you. Like, I don't know how to explain it, but it's stuff from God given stuff to you that, that, that you have a drive for that nobody else does. And it's just fishing. I mean, I don't, I, I started fishing obviously as a young age and we, we grew up like in the summers at Douglas Lake, just bluegill fishing. That's, and that's about the only thing my dad could ever catch is bluegill. And it had to be on a bobber or something where he could see, yeah. it, you know, there was no feel to it. But like, I remember I got, I got hooked up with uh, one of his workers. He worked at a factory down here that, that, that made books and paper. And one of the guys, there's always one of the guys that's a good fisherman in all these factories in East Tennessee. But one yeah. of the guys, he only night fished. That's all he did, black lights at night. And uh, I remember going with him when I was maybe 14 or 15 years old. And then after that, I was like, you know, and I'd already been bass fishing. But like after that, I really started learning how to, to fish a worm and fish it deeper and you know it, it progressed from there and then i started fishing tournaments when i was 16 and then once i was 18 i was fishing bfls and probably didn't have any business fishing a bfl at 18 but i mean it's like i got a check at like one of the events pretty quick and then when i was around 20 is when i got hooked up with a local guy Charlie Rash, which was like the East Tennessee stick and is still the best fisherman that I know of that fished Cherokee and Douglas. And then me and him fished together for 10 years. And then my fishing knowledge went from like right here to like way up here. And I always say, you know, I already had a base of fishing skill before I fished with Charlie. And toward the end, when me and Charlie stopped fishing together, there were certain things throughout the day that I would see like with my eye that I think we could have done different. And when, when it all came together for me is when I stopped fishing with Charlie that I merged everything that I learned from him, but I merged it with my own style and it came together and it, it fishing was just like, dude, I'm, you know, I'm catching them. And, you know, uh, me and a friend of mine, we won like angler of the year, like three times in one of the local biggest trails, which has never been, still never been done. And then we won a classic, won a boat. And another funny thing is like I had an 18 and a half foot Triton that I had and fished out of it for 13 years. And this is like, I, I've said it before, like everything's meant to be like, like there's certain people put in your life. And not, just like I told you about Aaron Martins, where I met him for 15 minutes at a boat ramp. And if it wasn't for him meeting, meeting him, I, I might've made it, but I definitely wouldn't have been pushed to do what I'm doing now. But anyway, like, uh, so I fished out of 18 and a half foot trout and won a 19 and a half foot Ranger and put a 225 on it. So I could have a bigger boat and go farther fished out of that ranger one year in the opens qualified for the elite series sold that ranger for my entry fees for the first year so that's how like it's like stuff was just perfectly put together you know couldn't wrote it anybody 
Yeah. No, I, and I agree with that. I think that that it, that that people are put in your life and and situations and people are put in your life to happen and and a lot of times those situations are people are you know, a lot of them are really just positive from the start. When you meet oh, yeah. Aaron, it's hard not to be positive around Aaron. Oh, but yeah. I mean, even the negative, I think, happens in everybody's life for a reason. You know oh, what I mean? It, whether, yeah. whether you accept it or not at the time, it, in my experience, it seems to work out. Like, and it sucks to hear that when things yeah. are going bad. But but I think that, yeah, you're right. People are put in your life for a reason. And um, and uh and, and we don't have control of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it, it's amazing. And when you look back, those little nuances, when you look back, how important the smallest things in life actually become the most important thing. Yeah, I've said that a thousand times. And just like, it's like we, you just said, like, it's. Somebody, somebody's here. So it does you no good if everything was easy, you know, if you didn't have to work for it. Like, and that's like sleeping out of the back of my truck and, and sleeping with Aaron uh, in the camper there for all those years. You know, you look back at that and be like, dude, that's just, you come a long way. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, when, when that was all going on, did you think about it the same way you think about it now? Or was it just like, man, I just want to get through today and this guy's good enough to have me here. Or were you like, man, this is, I'm with freaking Aaron Martins and getting an opportunity to, you know, yeah. I never did feel like I'm with Aaron Martin because he was such a friend. Like, it, it wasn't like all stroke, but I remember blasting off like my first tournament. It's at Seminole. And I remember my co-angler sunk my truck because he couldn't drive a stick and told me he could. I don't know if you remember that. I my remember stick, it. I my remember stick was up at the door. <laughs> I'm just human, you know, cause this is my first time. I want to come out and catch him. And, uh, I remember being like, you know, dude, there's Van Damme. I'm fishing against freaking Van Damme today, you yeah. know? And then just getting my teeth kicked in, finished 104th, the first one, and then ran off like five or six checks in a row my rookie year, you know? And I just, man, some of that some of that stuff was just a blessing because I, 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 I never did fish anything but Cherokee and Douglas, and that's all I knew. So all that grass stuff was so new to me. All, you know, I, I had to take in so much, and I, I explained – so many times it was like I was I was grabbing onto a train that was going, you know, and I was just hanging on, you know. And some tournaments I'd bomb out and not do good, but uh, it was all – look back at it now, it's like, dang, it's you've come a long way, you know, from where you started. Yeah, yeah. No, it um, – all of those things are lessons. It's funny, man. I uh, Until you brought up that – what happened to your truck, I totally forgot about it, but I t- – as soon as you mentioned, I'm like, I totally remember it, but it just shows how things affect you and how they affect your memory. Cause you'll never forget that. And I pretty much almost totally forgot it because it, it wasn't my truck. That was, what did you say to your, <laughs> what goes through your mind when you see that for uh, the first day? <laughs> dude, I'm just like, you know, I said, I thought you could drive a stick. I can't drive one like this. I said, okay, <laughs> you, you get in the boat. I'll take the truck. And by the time I got back to the, to the uh to the boat they were already calling my number to go through so it was just like so stress that first term was just so stressful and uh i remember i, I, I went all the way because we had a back-to-back so i went all the way to florida and we had to fish st john's the next one forgot to put boat gas in my in my boat so i got it and the best best thing ever happened to me so i got out on the main george when it had all that beautiful grass and it's oh. awesome and, and I get out to Georgia and I realize I can't run anywhere. So I had to fish the entire day. Best thing ever happened to me because I just slowed down, fished, and that's what it takes in Florida and end up cracking like 20 some pounds a second day down there and made a check. And like I said, I ran off five or six checks from there the rest of the year. But, you know, you talk about being like, oh, you know, you know I'm still like that with some fish. I'm like, Greg, I mean, Greg, hey, I've got, and I'm so old school. I've got so much respect for the older guys, man, and, and fishing against Fritz. I love Fritz, man. Yeah, love Fritz. I talk to Fritz every chance I can, and like one of my dreams is to go to go fishing with Fritz. Like, just let's just go throw a crankbait. I don't care where we go. I don't have to learn no holes. Let's just man, you go throw a crankbait somewhere. And uh, I still got a lot of respect for all the guys, and I just it's just I guess it's upbringing. But a lot of the older guys, man, I'd still uh, I'm still in awe of, yeah, if you can say that, yeah. Yeah, and and I think that's one of the coolest things about our sport. You know what I mean? Like, look at David Fritz. Like, there's a guy that 
when you were in your formative years growing up and dreaming of maybe one day I'll do part of that's the dude you were watching. Well, he's still competing. That I mean, it's one of the weirdest things about our sport. But it's one of the amazing, most amazing things about our sport. Oh, and, and dude, Fritz and Klun. Yeah. If you, look, if you look back at it from like nineteen, like eighty eight to two thousand, those suckers won probably sixty percent of the tournaments. <laughs> well, maybe more than that. They won everything. I got a cool Rick Klun for story for you too, because we were at the Harris Chain this year, and then I'm fishing back in there, Banana Cove, wherever it's. I don't know what it's called, yeah. but anyway, I had one spot back there where there was actually a school of fish. I, nobody else, for some reason, nowhere else found it. And I pull up there the first day, and I, I've railed like 20 in a row. And Clun's just kind of fishing around me, you know, all there. And after I've caught like close to 30, I look at Rick, and I said, Rick, how many – and this is just uh, – this is awesome. I said, Rick, how many you got? He said, I got three. And, I've you know, I've called 20. And I said, uh, well, you want to come get some of this? And he's paused for just a second and said, no. He said, you you go ahead. He said, I'll find me two more somewhere else. But he said, because if I come over there and throw with you, he said, there's other guys that are over there thinking it's, it's going to be okay for everybody to come over there and throw. And uh, so I was like, that's fine with me. Next three casts, I caught a five, a four, and a three. Wow. And, he, and, he still, and he still caught 20 pounds. So that, that was one of my coolest Rick Clun stories. Is like he's like, nah. He said, I'll find me, I'll find me two more somewhere else. So just- he's a, he's amazing. Like, and I don't think I, I don't, and it feels like every podcast I say the same thing because we end up talking about Rick Clun. But I really do. Like, I'm like, it amazes me, and and I don't think people even realize how amazing he is. At, because they don't get to see all those little decisions. You know what I mean? Like all those oh, yeah. moments where somebody said, come here and do this. And he, one of the rarest things in this sport is finding somebody who can make decisions based on the entire field or based on what's right, not just what's going to be right for them. And man, Rick Klon, I've seen over and over again. Like I, I'm sure I've told you like when, when he was leading that tournament, that Combs ended up winning. Yeah. And it got delayed that final day because of a dust storm. Rick Klun walked in the trailer, and I remember thinking at that time, I've never heard a pro like act like this. And he was like, there was nine other guys in the trailer, or I think 11 other, because we were top 12 at the time that would fish on Sunday. And uh, he said, I'm the only guy who can make it to my fish today. Mm-hmm. This weather ups the odds of me winning by something percentage. He probably had it all worked out. Yeah. Um, and he said, but the wrong call to make is to send us today because everybody should have the same opportunity. Nothing should be done to give me an advantage to win this event. And I'm like, and then Combs ends up winning the event, which was great for Combs and everything. But you watched like that day off his fish got roasted by a bunch of locals. But you're just like, man, and this dude, like it's nothing to do with, but he, he'd make the same call over again where most tournament anglers would be like, they want to go if the weather helps them. <laughs> right, yeah, and and and, that, and it probably hadn't won in 10 years. You know, it's probably no. like 10 was probably the FLW at like Pickwick in 01 or something yeah. by that point. So, yeah, man, and that's – and, 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 and fishing and, and golf are a lot of related because there's a lot of like an integrity and honor in it because, you know, if you're in golf, nobody can see you if you was to tap a ball and you get a penalty stroke. you got to call out on yourself. And fishing's the same way. If you don't call out one when you're supposed to, you know, you, you can you can choose not to call that in, but, you know, integrity is, you know, you're going to call it on yourself. And, you know, even though we have Marshall, some some events we don't. So there's a, there's a lot of – and Rick's got that, man. And, uh, you know, and the thing about Rick, Rick's still – I don't know, he's probably 75, 76. 75. Now, but man, he, he, still, he still competes. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and look at Chickamauga. You know, I, he – and what's funny is me and him are in the same same place the first day. And he watched me catch four. I think I caught four three pounders out of there, and he caught one. And I come back in there at like one o'clock, and he's still in there. And I'm like, "Geez, he's still in here." And he weighs in like twenty four pounds. <laughs> and he said he only had like one fish or two fish at like noon, and he catches twenty four pounds out there. And he's I and mean, maybe he's still. That's that's what's impressed me is like you look at a lot of the other anglers that are up in their age that I don't, I, and I don't know what, at what point in life do you start losing that ability to be competitive, but he's still got it at 70 some years old. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, that the dude is an anomaly. Um, 
your rooming situation is kind of an anomaly right now. Like if you look at the angler of the year, I mean, number one, what a perfect way to room together. I mean, let's all just be one, two and not one, two and three. I think it's five. Is it four, five, and six? You're in in Angler of the Year right now. Uh, I haven't looked. You don't, at don't know. Okay, well, you're all right beside each other. Okay. I, I knew we were. I knew we were all like back to back to back, but I'm not sure what number we are. Okay. Do you not pay attention to that stuff, or are you like Brandon Paul, like you don't want to know what position you're in? I don't ever look at it. Why? I mean, it, what what good does it do? You know, I, that's that's another like. People, I, I fish total. I'm, I'm a little bit different. I don't think when it comes to because I, people like set goals and all yeah. that stuff, and I, I don't set goals because I'm like, you know, my goal is to go out and fish as hard as I can and do the best I can every tournament and let it chips fall with May. You know, I can't, I can't complain about or I can't, you know, help what I can't control. So I don't ever look at look at it. You know. Um, there's some I would like to have over again, but no, I don't ever go back and I don't, I don't ever look at like standings and all this stuff because I don't want any added pressure to me. And doesn't mean nothing mid season, you know, just tell me where I'm at the end of the season. You know? Yeah, it's true though. It is it's honestly true. Like, I mean, it's literally every problem in fit pro fishing gets fixed by one thing. Catch bigger fish. Like yeah. no matter where, where you're at, it, it's exactly. catch them. Yeah, and and as long as you just focus on so there wasn't like an experience that you've had in the past where you were like I focused on this and I laid off them or anything like that. It was just a decision to not pay attention to that stuff. Yeah, I don't think I've ever. I don't know. I like shoot my first couple of years on tour. I probably looked at it just to see if I was going to requalify. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But uh, anymore, it's just like yeah, I don't look as much. It's just I just go out there and try to fish hard. And I, I think if you do that, I mean right things going to happen in my opinion. Okay. Well, let's imagine you were a person who looks at that kind of stuff, but if you were, what you would see is you and both your roommates, both the Drews, uh, Benton and cook, uh, you guys are all right beside each other, all happily in the top 10 for angler of the year. So things are going good. Basically the halfway point of the season. Yeah. Do you guys work together or is it just a, a roommate bit. situation? A little bit, but I don't, I don't fish anything like they do. And, you know, uh, we've talked about, I rarely, you know, turn the day, I rarely ever see them on the water. We saw each other on Chickamauga, uh, but like normal, a normal tournament, I rarely, rarely ever see the guys. I don't know why that is. I just, we just have different styles of fishing and, you know, it, I guess we can all make that work, you know. How did you, how did you guys end up being a, a group that roomed together? Uh, me and Benton knew each other. I think I met, I met Benton years ago at a, at a ICAST and, um, it was right about the time Aaron, Aaron had bought a smaller camper and we could yeah. not fit in it. And, uh, I was sleeping in my truck a lot and Benton had something happen. Not sure what he called me up. He's like, man, you want to room together? Blah, 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 blah. And this was, I can't remember what year this was, but I was like, yeah, that'd be fine. Cause that did help me split the cost with somebody else. So me and him started rooming together. We roomed together for a few years and then, he knew Cook from way back, and I didn't know him. And uh, he said, "You mind Cook rooming with us?" And I was like, "Is he a good dude?" And he's like, "Yeah." So, I, so Cook Cook ended up rooming with us too. And uh, yeah, we make it work, and we and we share. And that's the thing about it is too, you know, uh, we share information. Like I tell him if I'm catching them, and, and that, having somebody you can trust, yeah, you know, is 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 big, you know. And I don't. There's a lot of situations where I would rather not talk to another angler just to keep a friendship, you know, does that yeah. make sense? Because if I find out I'm, you're lying to me, I'm done with you, you know, I, and that's just the way I am. And uh, there's a lot of times I don't even want to talk fishing information with other people. Yeah. Well, you can't look at the person different. If you know that you're lied to me, that yeah. you start wondering, you know, well, what else were you lying to me about? Yeah, yeah. exactly. So I, I just like, I try to keep like other things just friendly and just talk fishing with just a couple of people. So the weird thing is you say you don't fish anything with them, but those two dudes fish remarkably similar. If you yeah, watch their but... styles and to have all you guys beside each other in standings, I mean, it's pretty bizarre. Like if you, if you were the third member of guys who were set on site fishing and fishing the way they both fish, it would make more sense. But so you fish fairly different this first half of the season, but, but, but you're all catching them. I got to make things good. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a it's definitely been a shallow sight fishing type year. Obviously, John Cox is. He, I'm assuming he's still leading the uh, angler yeah. year after Chickamauga. I mean, it's been one of those years, and you know, I'm I've 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 found out like if I can, what I've done differently as far as my rookie years and what I do now is like I I look for my strengths, and my strengths is usually power fishing, winding something, uh, you know, stuff like that, and that's something I've had to play, you know, both in St. John's, Harris Chain, uh, the Classic. Um, it, it was working at, at uh, Santee Cooper till it got really warm, and then I figured out how to catch those fish really slowing down. And, you know, that's just – that's probably the biggest change that I've made is just look for your strength more. When you're competing, like what percentage of your spots are, are like what percentage of your moves are are literally just we're following a rotation that I've preset in my head, and what percentage of them are there is no rotation. I just go fishing and wherever it leads me. Pretty much, I don't I don't ever have a preconceived. I mean, I'm if I'm fishing if I'm fishing deep, I might like try to go like I'm gonna hit this school and then I'm gonna try to get on that school. But any shoot man anymore, I just I hate fishing deep tournaments, and I, I can't stand it because again I'm old school on stuff, and we were, we were fishing that stuff around the house before when I and I had a flasher, you know we didn't have yes. we didn't have GPS maps, and now that now that it, <laughs> now that it gets crowded, it's just like I don't like it anymore. And I'm <laughs> the first time I ever met Patrick, I didn't even meet Patrick, I didn't even know Patrick. And Patrick pulls up, pulls up on me on a hole at, uh, at Gunnersville. And I'm like, dude, get the heck out of here. I'm, a, I'm trying to fish. And I held that grudge on Patrick for like a year before I ever talked to him. Cause I'm like, I'm so like, I don't, I don't try to mess with anybody else on the water. I give everybody the room and, you know, deep places is just like, I don't want to be messed with. And, and is in the way fishing is anymore. It's just like, I don't like doing it. I'd rather just grind it out shallow winding something as I would going out and fishing a spot, you know? And so that, in your opinion, that may, that's made the offshore game harder. Just the, it's just the amount, the percentage of people that have it now before you had to work a lot harder to get it. Am I reading that right? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, let's, and I hardly ever fish when I'm home anymore, but like we've had three, four, five weeks, whatever we've had off. So I went to Douglas uh, just a couple of days ago, a week ago, something like that. And I, I put in my boat and I turned the corner and there's a guy fishing a deep place. And I go a quarter mile, there's another guy fishing a deep place. There's an, And I go, I mean, every deep place that I could see, there was a boat sitting on. This is in April. The fish wasn't even out deep. And I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going around. I go to the bank, and within 10 casts, I catch five on the bank in like a foot of water. And and I'm like, well, maybe they are offshore. I checked like five places, and it's there was no fish off the bank. And it's just like – Everybody now like thinks it's cool to fish off the bank, and they wait on them to get out there. You know, they're yeah. they're wanting to be the first person to catch them out there, and it's just it's just it's not as fun to me. It's like even having a rat boat. I love having a rat boat in your own tour. You obviously, you're sponsored, but like having one local just trying to go out fishing, and everybody's looking at you. You know, it's just it's hard to deal with sometimes. But yeah, I'm definitely morphed into more of a shallow water guy than I have been a deep water guy. But forward-facing sonar is still a big player for you, correct? It has been. Yeah, and, you know, it's it's been a player more for grass than it has been for just looking at fish. I, I can, like Cayuga that year, I could have won Cayuga and, and Champlain when I, when I had a chance. It wasn't I was seeing fish, but I could literally see grass edges and, and isolated things of grass. So it just – that's changed, I think, a lot of people's uh, fishing – outlook is just not only do you see fish but you can see and now I've, I've 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 tuned it up where i've got two of them up there now so i've got one forward facing garmin live scope and then i've got the other one laid on perspective mode and just the just the vision you can see now is just it's crazy to see fish swim around you know that are bass won't bite your lure you know it drives you crazy but still yet it just uh the more information you can take in i think it's the better is the way i look at it what do you think the ultimate, and not not in a good or bad way, but what do you think the ultimate change in the sport is from that? I mean, obviously, there's you've got two of them, so you so you obviously have embraced it. You're a little bit old school, but a little bit new school. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I like electronics, but I'm I'm not sure. I mean, it's just that uh, a lot of fish that wasn't getting tapped on are now are now getting caught is the biggest thing I, I see now. Whether and I could tell a difference, like just just the minimum time I had it at St. Clair, like practice, and you know that I was thinking I was in second after the first day up there, maybe in the top five after day three. But it was funny to watch those fish get accustomed to that sonar and how quick they got, you know, acclimated to what was getting ready to happen. Because yeah. the first three days, you could just go around, see one, pitch it over there and catch it. And then by the fourth day, it was like they were trying to get away. Like they could, I don't know if they could feel it or whatever. So that's, I think it's going to make some, some of it tougher, but, and it might make, it might make it where it's, uh, you know, the shallow game might come back into play stronger than what it, what it has been I'm, I'm not sure but it's a uh, it's fun to fun to see some stuff that you would normally see what's the biggest advantage it gives you aside from catching fish is it just the fact that you're able to learn on every cast so to speak in in the right situations the, yeah the biggest thing is just like i said the more information you can take in and I, I can't really give you an example other than just like just just seeing those just being able to see grass lines and just to see one little kick out, just, I mean, it might be like four feet off the main line and how many fish can hold on something so small. And you'd never see that just, just fishing down through there unless you luckily just, you know, wind your, your crankbait or whatever around it. But like there's several times at Cayuga that year I was up there that I could be going down a grass line and just accidentally pan out there and there'd just be one clump way away from the rest of it that I would have never made a cast at and, and to throw over there and catch the fish. So it's just, you get to, it's just to, just to see so much more. And, it, and if you ever get dialed in, like what fish are holding on and be able to find that brush pile fishing, gosh, it's so good brush pile fishing in the summer and stuff. Cause you remember we used to have to line up, a, you know, we'd have a GPS point, but even if you have a GPS point, it's still hard to hit some brush piles. Now you just pull up, see it, you know, you, you can hit it every time now. It just makes you efficient in a lot of ways too. Yeah. Yeah. And I also, I think we're also seeing on the elite series, there's what it does negatively too. I mean, there's some anglers that are, that are very good with it and, and are having some incredibly bad seasons. Like since it's became a major player, do you think what we're seeing is we're seeing people relying on it too much or, or, or not knowing when not to use it? Maybe so. I mean, uh, uh, I, I don't think we, I, and I'm, I'm trying to think back of like when we've had a tournament, but I don't, I'm not sure if we had a tournament dominated by it other than uh, Patrick at uh, Lake Fork that fall. You know, I look at other trails that have hit stuff right, like Sam Rayburn this year where they really caught him forward face. I don't think we've, that I can think about, I don't, I don't think we've, we've hit it right yet where it's just a domination of, of, of Ford facing on the R tour yet, other than, like I said, the, the Lake Fork. And I might be wrong. You might be able to correct me on that, but I can't think of one that was dominated other than that tournament. No. And I think you're right. I mean, St. Clair, I think would throw into it. Like if you look that year, it was, I mean, I could tell the weirdest thing was I could tell covering the events on the water. I could tell I could be a hundred, 300, 400 feet away from an angler and tell who has it and doesn't have it because just oh, yeah. by the way they're fishing, like, oh, man. There was, yeah. you're, you're just blind, you're just following fish. Yes, it was such an, like, that's the only term that I can ever realize that you were in such an advantage if you had it. And I remember looking at like <laughs> Swindle and some of the other guys were pulling their hair out over there because they didn't have it, knew they were getting ready to get their teeth kicked in. And they did because they didn't have it because it, you, I mean, you were so much efficient. You didn't have to, you didn't have to sit out there and drag around with the wind of the current. You could see where they was at and throw it. And that's the thing about St. Clair is, you know, it's so flat that they don't, they roam so much. Yeah. There's not like a, a big shell bed out there that they're going to be stacked on. And there probably is somewhere in that place. I've never found it, but they roam so much and you would just be so much efficient just going around looking for them. How do you, how do you stay on top of everything you have to stay on top of as a pro angler? You know, as far as, you know, this stuff came along and, and you had to be in, in the, in the lead edge of that. And, and it's, this is not the only thing there's things constantly, whether it be technique or mechanics or electronics or whatever that you guys have to stay on top of. How do you do that? Do you specifically do something to stay on top of that? Or is it just the world you live in? I just the world I live in. It's like, uh, man, I still don't own a, own a glide bait. 
still don't. I don't know why. I just I've never never thrown a glide bait, never owned one. Uh, there, there, and there's there's stuff that I don't I don't uh, you know you you still go back to what you've ever had success. Yeah. With. You know I think you got that base and it, you know you branch off with here and there with other stuff. But I've never been like crazy. Let's you know I've got to have this glide bait. Blah 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 blah. I've always been like this is my this is my key thing here and this is what I do. And, you know, we throw in some electronics with it, make it better, but I've never been like, never been like crazy on stuff like that. If if that makes sense to you. Yeah, no, it does. It does. I think you, that's kind of pretty straightforward the way I would describe you though, too. Like you're very good at, at assessing. This is where I need what I'm, what plays into my game and you don't get distracted by other things. Um, What's your ultimate goal in fishing? You know, like if you if you had to write down, right? You know, these are the things that I need to accomplish. Is dude? Is, I, I mean, I think ultimate goal is to make a living. I mean, I, I mean, really, realistically, I mean that that's all you can. If I can, if I can go fishing and fish and and, and make a living and 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 live that way, that's my ultimate goal. Do yeah. I want to win stuff? Yes. Would I love to win Angler of Year? Yes. Would I love to win a classic? Yes. But the, the goal in is let's just make a living and let's get better each year. And let's, you know, and I love the competition. So let's go out there and compete. And, uh, and it seems to be each year has got a little bit better for me. I mean, again, because if you look back when I started, I had nothing. I had Cherokee and Douglas and that's all the knowledge I had. And, and now that I've, I've, you know, I've learned how to catch them up north, learn to catch them in the grass. It's just, it gets a little bit better each year for me. How did you learn to catch them up north? Did you did, was that time or was that figuring something out like? Did, and, I, and I talked to you about it before when I when I when I lost all those fish to Champlain up there that year. You know, I I, I got to go with Corey Johnston one time, and I'm yeah. not sure I'm not sure where we went at, but it was a uh, uh, Paul Combs was working at Garmin, an awesome guy, awesome technician, and uh, we were talking about up north. He's like, man, you need to go with Johnstons up there, and I didn't know I didn't know him at all, you know. And, he said, uh, he said, you, uh, he said, call Chris or Corey. And I was like, really? They, you think that we'd go out somewhere? He said, why not? He said, they fish FLW, fish bass, you know? Yeah. And so I ended up talking to Corey and, uh, we were, it was like a week or something before we had to go to, uh, to, uh, St. Lawrence river. Yeah. So I'm like, I knew Theo Chang up there. He used to work for Megabass. So I'm like, yeah. I'm going to go up there and visit. I'm going to visit Theo. I'm going to go by the tackle shop up there. Uh, and I can't remember the name of the, the tackle shop that's there around Toronto right now. Pro Jays, I bet for you. Pro I was yeah. like, I'm going to go by see Theo. I'm going to go Pro Jays, and then I'm going to go fish with Corey. Oh, but I was yeah. never on that list. Just just <laughs> want to point that out. Of all the Canadian things he was doing, not even made the top three. But anyways, continue on with your story. So, uh, we got I got to meet Theo. Theo, we went to like Chinatown in Toronto, got some good food, yeah. went up to Corey's, and I, I'm not sure if we fished Simcoe or whatever. Simcoe. Uh, and, and caught, you know, caught just – big ones and you know that was the the biggest thing for me to understand was like for southern like highland reservoir fish is like they relate to structure they go offshore and they do that they do that also up north but a lot of fish stay shallow and just different things to look for up there you know sandy areas uh boulder areas you know it's just it was just it was a lot because i've never experienced anything like that even though aaron could catch a heck out of me and him never got to fish together up there so i never had the experience so i only got to fish uh, i think one day with Corey. but just like the things that i learned that day i mean that i went back and took that stuff to st Clair or not not st Clair, but uh but to st lawrence the next week and the first day had like 20 22 23 pounds the second day had like 20 pounds and it's just like it it I understood it a little bit more. Not not like I understood it completely, but I understood it more than what I had the previous time I was up there. And I don't think I've ever missed a check up there since. I'm not sure, but I don't think so. All of a sudden, Corey and Chris's phone just got a whole lot busier. <laughs> <laughs> I went fishing with them one day and haven't missed a check since. But I, I do think that there's I have a weird theory, and let me run this by you, and I, I'll get roasted by a bunch of people from the south. But I feel like if you look at our tour right now, the northern guys take the south more serious than the southern guys take the north. And what I mean by that is if you look at 
a- any myriad of names, Seth, Corey, Chris, all those guys that would be from the North. Do they, they come down two weeks before the events start in Florida and stuff like that. And they're spending weeks getting their boats all ready and everything, but they're spending that time. And it, it's that time that you really learn, in my opinion, like that you really like to really learn how to, how the ins and outs. And then when we go North, you don't see a lot of, you hear a lot of Southern anglers saying, well, I, I'm sure I'll survive it and whatever, but they don't put in the same amount of effort to fish out of their style. Do you think I'm totally wrong in saying that? Or is you, know, there... you know why? Because I buy it up North. You know? Oh, yeah. Perfect. And it's like, like a lot, a lot, a lot of Northern guys I talk to is like, you know, we're not, I'm not like in shock if I go out here and only get six bites on Douglas or six bites yeah. on Smokey, you know, and I, you learn how to grind through it. Whether as you go up north, you're going to catch 30 or 40, you know, yeah. and I think, I think a lot of that is it's just a different, it's just a different mentality of, of fishing. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I think a lot of it is it's just not as easy to catch them down here and it might require some more some more stuff, you know, and plus if you look at Gussie, he's got to come two weeks ahead of time. Cause that's about how long it's going to take him to get to the U S anyway. So, <laughs> well, yeah, but I also think that the fact that they bite up North is part of the negative because the fact that they bite, yeah. that's what lulls you into that feeling of, man, I'm catching th- three and a half and fours and I should be fine. And then you find out you're not fine with three and a half pounders, you, you know, um, so, I, I mean, I don't know. I just think it. I've just watched over, like, you see guys come up and they'll just, you know, they, you need to spend, I think you need to spend a time on a fishery so you can disrespect the fish almost. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you, yeah. you, like, you just watch it. But I could be totally wrong. Let us know in the comments. My, it's just a theory. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, it's, it's, it's different. I mean, it's just, uh, I don't know. It's just, it, it, it up to I will have I will say like Northern Lakes put a lot more pressure on you because you already know going out of the box that you're going to have to have 16 to 19 pounds or 17 yeah. to 19 pounds and there's a huge difference between catching one that's three and a quarter or catching one that's three and a half. I mean at the end of the day, yeah, I think it puts a lot more pressure on you up there. It's fun because you're going to catch them, but like you said, there's just you know I'm on three and a half and fours, but sometimes that's just that's just not good. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, and uh, hey, I know that it, that's just a theory, but I just, I just look at like you. A lot of people leave the luck factor when they come north. You know, they're like, yeah, I'll get them, and and then you see, you know, like on day one, and they had eighteen pounds, and they're like, I'll be fine, but they're not. Right. <laughs> I mean, um, it, I feel the same way, and I know I get roasted for it. I feel the same way when it comes to when if anybody. Fish is for largemouth when we're on the St. Lawrence River. In my opinion, like unless you, and I get it, people have top tended it with largemouth. But if you're going to be on the Elite Series for any extended period of time, you know you got to figure these things out, right? Mm-hmm. They're going, yeah. they're going to be a major part of it. I mean, look at how much your years have changed since the North didn't become so scary to you. Yeah, the first year I was at St. Lawrence, I actually fished for largemouth. I could not catch smallmouth out there, and I was so. Just that much, that amount of current didn't, I mean, I'm like, oh, you just go around and drive, what, you know, I'm like, this don't make sense to me because I'm used to fishing a particular point or a particular spot. And, you know, it's just, that's probably another thing that changes. It's like, you know, at home, I'm, I'm fishing this, whereas up there, it's like you're fishing an area type deal. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's, it's just, it's totally different. But the amount, the, how good those fishers are and then to continue to keep putting out the fish that is, it's, quite remarkable yeah now uh, but i but see it, it's weird from being from the north i look at the southern fisheries and i feel the exact same as you do where i'm like our fisheries make sense they're protected six months of the year from yeah. oh, ice yeah. or whether it's too windy to get out or whatever but but what blows me away is gunnersville like how that like every time you drive across those bridges somebody's fishing them like not yeah. during a tournament like every day and they just continue to punt out fish it's 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 incredible from that end of things yeah who's the most frustrating guy to compete against on tour is there anyone that frustrates you mm, no i don't think so frustration as in don't like them or just like no no i mean or? if you want to go that direction no. you can, but no i just meant like i mean i would find a lot 
like I used to always say Jordan Lee's frustrating because he'd be like, well, I'm just going fishing. And, yeah. and yeah. look what I got. Yeah. You know, Matt Robertson's frustrating. I mean, some of the, you look at some of the hooks he's using. It, it, you're rusty hooks running. and you're winning. Yeah, <laughs> a, he, he still got rust on them. They just pulled them out of the carpet. <laughs> no, I mean, dude, the thing about it is we have so many, we have so many anglers that are so talented that, 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 People and you talked to I talked to Justin Atkins about it and he's like man you know what he's like I fished every tour there is and they, they this is as good as it gets like and there's been many times I've said you know if I can go in and catch this number let's say 13 pounds okay and then I go to the tournament and I catch 14 and I've come to the way and I've got 14 so I've got even a pound better than what I thought I could do and then I'm in like 60 and it's just like how do they catch him that freaking good every time and uh, no they're just uh, there's still just a bunch of guys that are, uh, that are good, that, that are, uh, that I have a lot of respect for, like not necessarily frustrating, but just respect as anglers. And, you know, I can't think of like one off the top of my head, but like, uh, if you're like Paul and it's very talented, like yeah. everywhere you go, you know, he's going to be, an, he's going to be a competitor. Obviously Jason Christie's a, I got a lot of huge respect for Jason he, and, and just, you know, they're just, they're just good, you know, and, and again, they're guys, you know, I think Jason's a prime example. Of somebody found, finds their strength and fishes it ever, you know, a lot, a lot of every tournament. But, uh, no, there's just a ton of, ton of guys I got respect for and just are frustrating because they're that good. Who was the guy that you, you grew up like when, before you ever joined the elite series, like who was the guy watching on TV, reading it in the Fritz. magazine? Who? Fritz. Yeah, absolutely. Fritz. I mean, it, I've still got, it's somewhere in there. I still got like a 1994 Bassmaster Edition Fritz, like a two-part series. And I do. Don't ask me why. why. Don't ask me why I've always liked crankbaits. I do not know why. I mean, I grew up on you know this is a headwater of Tennessee River, obviously. But dude, there was something about catching them on a deep diving crankbait that I've always enjoyed, and I don't know why that is. But it it would definitely be Fritz. I remember the guy I didn't like on the outside was Van Dam. I'm like, dude, why do they keep giving this guy coverage? I mean, it's just like every term of Van Dam, Van Dam, Van Dam. And then, dude, it's just like after the first year, after meeting Van Dam and, and just fishing against him all those years, it's just like you got so much respect for the guy. And oh. it's it's different now. It's like I used to be like a person that, that rooted, almost rooted against certain people. But, like, when you realize you're all in the same – you're all in the same deal here. You're all fishing. You, you can't really – like, if there's five people who got a chance to win tomorrow, who are you pulling for? I don't really have a favorite because I don't want – we're all in the same deal here, you know. Yeah. It's just like it's hard to hard for me to pull more for somebody, you know. Obviously, if it's somebody that haven't won before or something like that, but, like, you're all in the, like – you're all in the mud together, you know, and you understand how grueling it can be. It's just – that's that's and if you want to speak to young people, how can you tell young people that this is the career decision they want to be? You know, it's it's great. From there's opportunities that I've had. I met people that I would never never met, yeah. never met if I was still teaching high school. But like to to really understand how hard it is to do it, like you, you just like I can't encourage you to do it. But if it's something you want to, you know, you go for it. Yeah. Yeah, dreams not strong enough. I've always said that. I mean, it yeah. has to be a nightmare that this isn't what you do. Like a d oh, dreaming of doing this, like you need to, because it doesn't matter how strong you dream to do something. When you've got your second blowout of the night and yeah. you're at the side of the road changing the tire, because it happens to everybody. Um, I was never a huge Fritz fan growing up. You know why? And I told him this when I first met him. I'm like, you frustrated the crap out of me. I would watch and scream at my TV because he would, during the Fritz Blitz, when he won it, you know, for a while there, it seemed like he'd win every tournament, like if it's lined up for him. But he would always fight those fish in that crankbait, and he would always get, like, to the back of the, the light post. It's 2 o'clock oh, yeah. in the afternoon, and he's still hand over hand. I'm like, pull your light post out. You don't need it anymore. Hey, went to Min went went to Minnetonka and cranked them up and kicked their teeth in up there. <laughs> the it is funny, you know. Hick, I had me. I did. This is one thing that me and Fritz would probably argue about now. And he's changed a little bit on on crankbait rod setup. But I remember the, the first Fritz crankbait rod I had. I was throwing a DD twenty two on it. It's like I'm sitting there winding this thing around. And I'm like, man, look, there's there's a freaking three pounder jumping out there. 
And it's like, I keep one, it's like three pounders got a plug in its mouth. You know, you keep, Oh, that's my plug. It's like, I, I could never feel what a crankbait does. And, and I got to think, this is a, I've actually thought about this a lot this year. The difference, there's a lot of difference now in the, the size of plugs we use now and the size of hooks where this, he was throwing a lot lighter plug the hooks. Most of the hooks he would use would be like a number uh, two at the most. A lot of them was numbers like fours, you know, and stuff like that. And I've t- I got to sit down with him at the, at the uh, classic. I was just walking in the street. There's Fritz standing, getting ready to go in somewhere and eat. And I'm like, Fritz, you want to go in here and eat? He's like, yeah, let's go. So I got to sit down with him. And I, one of the first questions I asked him, I said, Fritz, have you changed your I- ideas on like crankbait rods? Do you use a stiffer rod now? And he's like, yes. You, he said, I use a lot stiffer rod than what I used to in back day. I said, is it because like the hook size, the size plugs? Said, Absolutely. He said, you, and I said the same thing. He, he was talking about how light things were back then, smaller hooks. And now you got, you know, a one ounce plug. And that's probably the biggest thing that I've done crankbait wise. I use a lot stiffer rod than what I used to use when I was younger and still use a slow reel, but a lot stiffer, stiffer setup. You, do you throw braid at all? Because Fritz throws braid more in a crankbait than most people would assume. You don't do it? No, I'm straightforward. I usually use like 12-pound sunline like 90% of the time on all my cranking, just about. Yeah, no, I mean, it, Fritz is the difference there, but like he, he does throw braid more than I ever imagined he would. But and um, that's somebody I'm, I'm never going to argue about crankbait fishing. No, you can't. Fish. <laughs> you can't. If it works for him, <laughs> no. you, you can't. That's the kind of argument where, like, if, if your buddy walks in, if I walk in your house and you're on the phone yelling at somebody, and I'm like, who are you yelling at? And you're like, Fritz, about crankbaits. I'm like, just hang up the phone. Hang, <laughs> yeah. hang, yeah. walk up. You're drunk. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> He he is honestly like if you look at what he's done, like all the little nuances in crankbait fishing, you know, design throughout the, you know, whether it be now or and you look what he's doing with the Fritz side stuff, like you know what yeah. I mean. Every crankbait that man has designed has been a winner and a still a fish catcher to this yeah. day. Yeah, I, I agree. I couldn't agree hundred percent more because you look at all the things he's won and you know he's won this, won everything. But I think one of the most impressive things he's done is every crankbait that has his name has been like juice. If you yeah. look the, the, all the Rapala series, juice. I mean, this new, this new Fritz side plugs that Berkeley's got, I mean, it's, it's legit stuff. And that's, I think that's just as impressive as just how good a designer he is and knows what he wants as just winning all that stuff. Yeah. yeah no, he's, he's incredible. He is incredible. And, uh, and, and I think the fact that guys like him are still competing, I think sometimes people don't stop to look at like what he's done. You know what uh, I mean? Like it's, it's, I'm telling you every, every, if you look every tournament, like 88 to 2000, it was him or Rick Clun and like, uh, and then majority of them, it's unbelievable how, how good and dominant those guys were. Incredible. Incredible. Hey, what's your favorite movie of all time? Oh man. I don't think I have a favorite, but like tombstones probably, Oh, one of my favorites. Uh, I love old westerns. John, anything with John Wayne in it, I love. Uh, love funny stuff too. Step Brothers, stuff like that. I, I have a know, wide range of of stuff. Do you know Davy Hyde has never seen the movie Happy Gilmore? How can you never see Happy Gilmore? That's exactly what I said. He 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 told me he was doing other things while I was. <laughs> What right. you have to go more? Yeah, it's been out for 20 years, but he's been doing it. <laughs> it's been busy. He's been busy. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'm not so- shocked. I would have figured you to be a tombstone guy. Yeah, I love tombstone. Uh, I, I dude, the Jerry Lewis, like comedian Jerry Lewis. I could watch <laughs> me and my brother would watch his stuff. I could watch it all day long. Just just so stupid, but man, I used to love watching Jerry Lewis stuff. Would you would you consider yourself like an old soul? Yes. Like, I mean, everything, like whenever I see you, like you post a video of you watching a movie, like, and there's been several of them over the years. It's never something that it's not at least crackly or black and white. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I, not only do it and uh, consider it also, I feel like an old soul, man. <laughs> freaking fishing <laughs> will break you down. I mean, I had back surgery back last, I don't even told many people about it, but I had back surgery last August, just now getting, like I've been I've been down for like two years on that deal. Just now getting feeling where I'm feeling really good. I mean, like I've been in pain for two years on that. 
the the year the Clark won AOI and I did well, I, the last three tournaments here did not think I could get through those tournaments. That's how wow. much fun I was there. I remember Chickamauga, I had to crawl down the steps of the house we were staying at backwards just to get in the shower, just to get loosened up enough to go, just just make it to the truck. And then once you got the truck, you was ibuprofen, you know, ibuprofen all the way to the ramp, you know, to get just to fish. So it finally feels good to to have some relief. And then I got nicks all over me now, shoulder, elbow, you know, bike. Just, it takes a toll on you, but it's I'm finally starting to feel healthier than I have in the last couple of years. I think that's something in the sport that nobody like, you know what I mean? You hear people talk about he's dealing with this or whatever, and people just write it off, Mm -hmm. but it's no different than any other sport, except it is different. You're not going up to do, you know, like, I mean, if your job was to run a hundred meter race, you know what I mean? That's over in 10 seconds. You got to grit your teeth through that pain for eight to 10 hours. And, and I don't care who you are that, that pain distracts you, and it's one of the hardest things to compete through that I, I don't think anybody really takes it serious at all, really, unless you, you know what I mean, without the extreme where somebody had to leave a tournament or whatever. Other than that, people are like, oh, take an ibuprofen. Well, like, you know, you know how fishing is, like 90% of it is point of your ears anyway. It's so, it's so mentally focusing. So, and dude, when you've got, when you've got a constant back issue where you're, I mean, psychologically, I, I didn't realize like how how psychologically it plays with you when you oh, deal yeah. with pain all the time. Like I never did understand that till I dealt with it, and it's just like that wears you down. Like just just having that having that issue wears you down mentally and and physically. But it, it's uh, you know that comes to play with your fishing too. It's just like I wonder if I could have did better in certain certain situations where I didn't have that issue. And I don't know the we'll answer, but yeah, it's uh. It can it can play both ways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mean, without shadow of a doubt, I don't know anyone that's ever done real great when they're in bad. You know what I mean? Like you look yeah. at those last three events. That's when stuff started going rougher for you that year. You know what I mean? Like everybody, you see it. I've and and behind the scenes, we see it. I think. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I've looked at angler of the year races where you see an angler going, <laughs> then all of a sudden they just start tailoring off. Well, that's the same time that their shoulder got screwed up and yeah. in another sport they'd say go heal but in this sport uh yeah. th- there, there's not really a lot of healing time built i mean you yeah you you're pretty much you can't heal because you, your money's been made on on the tournament day you know and you, you know i'm sure some people can be like mentally strong on some of that stuff you look at like one of the most precious things when tiger woods i think won the u.s open on a broken broken t t or I don't know if it's a femur, but like tib or fib, that's yeah. so, that's unheard of. Like, how how do you even play golf in that much pain and still win it? You know, and it's just only there's only a you know handful handful of people that can actually pull something like that off. But it's just a massive respect for somebody to play through that. Yeah, no, it's it's incredible. It's incredible. But you're healthy. You're feeling good, and and yeah. you don't know where, but you're. Somewhere in the mix for Angler of the Year at the halfway point of the season. I, I think so. Yeah, if we keep keep catching them, that's all. Fish hard is all I can do. It's all you can do. Hey, how do you deal with Drew Cook when he doesn't catch him? Because he's the grumpiest dude on the Elite no, Series when he does. Not, no, I'm he's the, not. I am the grumpiest guy on the Elite Series when I don't catch it. There's no question. I don't want to be. I don't want you to talk to me. I I just want to. <laughs> Dude, I got so mad. I could tell stories all the time. I got so mad at Winyall Bay that year that I ran all the way to the Cooper River. And the first year I ran over the Cooper River, and it was the, I still say it was the easiest check I ever made because it wasn't a matter of just catching them. It was a matter of just getting there and getting back. You were going to get a check because it was a guarantee like eight to 10 pounds over there. And I remember <laughs> the last time at Winyall Bay, I ran all the way to Cooper River again, caught my same fish, bring it back. Missed a check by like three spots, and it was. Just, I was so mad that I got off stage, and I I was so focused on just being so mad that I drove straight home. And about uh, fifty miles out of town, I realized I left all my stuff at the hotel room. So I called <laughs> Cook and Ben. I was like, "Hey man, you mind if uh, y'all grab my underwear and uh, you know uh, stuff off the floor and just take it with you? I'll, I'll get it the next tournament." <laughs> yeah, but dude, I'm so I'm like. I'm probably the worst loser there is because I'm so competitive. I hate not catching them. Like, it drives me crazy this last tournament at Chickamauga that it was one and first and second place. 
was doing stuff that I'm really good at doing, and that's shallow water power fishing, just go down the bank. But it, it's chickamauga is a different animal anymore because it it's not it's not the go down there and catch a heck out of fishery anymore, even though it's still good. Yeah. It's just you don't get those bites. And if you didn't like tap into that, it was hard to do that the rest of the day. If you didn't if you didn't know that was going to happen. And I caught dude, the the best day of practice I've had in Elite Series was probably the third day of that that term on that system come through. I caught like 25 pounds that day and a lot of them were on a chatterbait and I'm like, I'm going to do well in this tournament and, and to come out of there fishing, getting, barely getting a check. And it was one that way, just kind of like, man, it hurts your soul. It's just, you can't get over it. I think that's a good trait though. Like I think that our society is screwed up in the whole, like you should be a good loser. No, you should. Like, I, I think you should be a respectful loser. I, you, and, yeah. and you can't maybe use the word lose it, but when you, when it, when you don't win, be respectful of the winner and the situation. But I think that it should suck to look, you know what I mean? Like the, oh, yeah. you should yeah, never I'm, be like, well, never got him. Maybe next time it's I not mean, bingo. And it's like, and it, and it, I remember there was, there was something said about like me leaving Lake Fork at that time. Cause I got the, I got the angler year lead going into Lake Fork. And I catch enough the first day to keep me in a hunt. And Clark really wasn't that much ahead of me. But the second day, like I remember, I remember I caught like a seven pounder at like two o'clock, had to weigh in like three. And I had an hour to keep doing that and never had another. And that, I'm telling you that, that, that was meant to be Clark's deal because I lost so many fish in that tournament. But like I knew that I had lost a year, I, even if Clark, you know, and people are calling me the next day after I've already left the second day and I was in Arkansas, still enough I could drive back. But they were like, where are you at? I'm like, I'm at the Duck Club in Arkansas. You're not here? I'm like, no, Clark's going to win it. They are like, you still got the lead. I'm like, listen, Clark's going to win this thing. I'm telling you. And it wasn't that I was a sore loser about Clark winning. Dude, I got mad respect for Clark winning. And I tell, you know, and he knows it. And I told him, you know, I've talked to him several times and like the whole – the whole deal of like the you know the the champions toast like yeah. I, I, I mean I told I said I told him I have never been to champions toast and it's just not my thing I didn't I nothing to respect but I remember t- talking to Clark I said Clark listen and I told I, I I made sure I told him this I was like listen I'm not going to championships toast tomorrow but I will tell you it is not because any, and I got my respect he's like I know I understand it's not your bag not your bag. And he, he knows, you know, I've got that respect. And a lot of the old guys I got respect for, but it's just like I'm so freaking competitive. I cannot stand not catching them, you know. And it's just it's not a sore loser thing. It's just like I said, it's just, it's just being competitive. And it's not settling for that. You know, I think that's a that's another thing that, that you, you can't settle for being like, you know, okay with losing. I can't stand being losing. And that comes from playing ball all years, coaching all the years. I, I want to. If I'm putting a basketball team together, I don't want a basketball team that, that settles on being okay losing. I want them to be – if you if you make a peep on the bus ride home, we're not going – you're not going home after – we're going to run suicides till you get – you know, till you get the little peeps out, you know, and, and realize losing is not okay. You know, in yeah. Some questions. I, it's – it's – dude, I mean, I look at my life and I look at, like, just my experience with – kids growing up and stuff and like listening to other parents talk about how, and I've always been conflicted. I've always been like, no, 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 you got to hate it. Like you literally, and and my son and me, same thing. Like when he beats me, he beats me. I never softball. You know what I mean? Yeah, I never let win, him win yet. Yeah, never. No. You should never let anyone win because they're going to, I had a buddy who, <laughs> who let his kid win all the time. And then as soon as his kid lost, Anytime it was a, a mess. Dramatic. <laughs> Dramatic. Didn't know what to do. Come back crying. Daddy, they didn't let me win. So, well, I think you should still come to Night of Champions, though. I mean, yeah. me and you are always going to disagree about that. I mean, you're going to win it one year. Nobody's going to show up, Mullins. It's going to well, just be me, you, and the chairs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I might, I might come, but I, I mean, it's just, I'm not, I'm, and you know what it's like, if we go to a meeting, I'm usually by myself over in the corner or something. I just don't, I just like being quiet and just over there on the side and just taking everything in. You know, I've never been just like flashy, let's go get dressed up kind of person, but it's not got anything to do with respect or anything. It's just the way I am. I know that. Have you always been that like high school Mullins? Were you like quiet? 
in school or? Yeah, I, was, I was too much of an idiot back then to know if I, what quiet was, you know what I'm saying? I guess. Oh, you were you were an idiot in high uh, school? Well, I still am some ways, but, uh, <laughs> dude, I don't know. It's just things changing. You just, sometimes you just want to just take stuff in, you know, be quiet. Yeah, I get that. Stuff like I get be, that. Just be humble. I get that. I get that. And I understand that. And I appreciate that about you. I appreciate you doing this dude, because I know you don't do a lot of these kind of things. And, and, uh, I think a lot of people got to see a lot of sides of you that you don't see because around competition dudes, you very much are that major league baseball pitcher that like, you know, he'll give you your press conference, but it's, you don't get to see a lot of the sides of you. Like there's a lot of, and is that intentional or is that just how you always have been? No, dude, it's just uh, the, the thing about fishing is and it's it, it's something I, it's, you know, you start off you fishing in enjoyment. You, you got a passion yeah. for fishing. But once you do it at our level, it's just like you are never satisfied. Don't matter how good you catch them, you are never. And that's the way I am in tournament days because it'd be like, you know, you got, you just went through three days of practice, grueling practice, you know, where it's never easy in practice usually. And then you, you come up to tournament and you're just so, like you're so just drained the whole, does that make sense to you? It yeah, just, no, I got it. You're just freaking drained. You're just focused on the job. You're trying to get through a tournament. You know, you're trying to do your best you can. And it's just like, I just get through this mode where it's just like, that's, I'm just fishing, you know, I'm just concentrating on fishing. It's just, I don't do a lot of talking. I just, uh, that's the way it is. It's just, it's just different. It's just, when you, when you come out of it and you know, you're, uh, you're, you're living, depends on the fish you catch it's just you've got a different uh a different i guess look at it in that in that regard yeah Maybe. no i get it and, and dude uh, as i tell you guys all the time the best thing in my opinion that any pro angler can be is themselves yeah i can if, if, if somebody feels the way you do and they try to fake it it never oh, yeah. works good uh, yeah know? yeah i agree 100 i agree 100 it's just like like if you ask me questions, you know, I'm I'll answer every question. Yeah. But, you know, but like me going out of the way and just just getting there rambling on, I'm like, no, you know, there's a bunch of people wanting to weigh in back, you know, that probably want to weigh in, get out of here, you know, we're gonna do that. But uh yeah, I'm just uh whatever it's just like this year, you know, I um we've talked about like interviews on on the dock. I didn't think nothing about it. You know, I'm not trying to offend nobody. I'm like, you want to do an interview on that? No. Didn't know it's going to offend anybody. Didn't know it was that serious. You know what I'm saying? But now I'm like, anytime you want to interview me, I want to. I'm going to answer your questions. I'm going to do. I'm going to. You know, I'm going to cross my T's, dot my eyes because I didn't. You don't realize a lot of things, and that goes back to like what we said earlier. Is like we don't get to see each other, or hang out. This is the longest probably me and you've talked. We've been on this phone for like an hour and ten minutes. Longest man you've ever talked, and I've known you. Yeah. For probably this is nine years that I've been on the. Is that right? 14, 15, 16, 17. Nine years that I've been on the Elite Series. Yeah. And it's long as we talked. You know, yeah. it just people don't understand we don't get to hang out very much. No, and and when you do, like any time me and you, when we had said conversation that you just alluded to yeah. earlier this yeah. year. We never got through three minutes of it without getting interrupted by, and that, and that's the greatest thing in the world that there's demand on on either of our times at an event. But to have one on one conversations like this, you don't get to have them. You know what I mean? Like, a, you know, maybe if you have dinner with somebody, that sort of thing. But but we're always pulled in different directions. And, and dude, uh, I didn't talk. I didn't talk to Ed Laughlin for two years because he cut me off on a bank at Ten Killer. <laughs> didn't talk to him for two years because he cut me off. But again, I don't know Ed. And I've since then got to know Ed. Ed's a heck of a nice guy. Great guy. He didn't mean anything about it, but, dude, I was so freaking mad because I was already in the top ten. I'm, I'm like, you know, I if I'd give people respect. Ed didn't know better. Pulls in front of me, and I'm like, two years later is when I finally got to talk to Ed about it. So, you know, it's just we don't we don't, we don't don't get a chance to know each other very good. Well, so, I mean, I, I, I feel like I got to know you a little better this time. And I feel like, I mean, it, you, our – interaction earlier this year and just obviously rather than tiptoeing around it, me and Mullins had a, whatever you want to call it. a We had, a to, come we had to come to Jesus meeting. Somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> we did because at one tournament I asked him in the morning and, and I can totally see it from your standpoint 
where you're like, no, nah, I don't need to do an interview. You, you know, I, you don't, need on, to I do don't it. care, whatever, you know? Yeah, no. And that's cool. Like, and I get that. Um, but I just kind of looked at it from a tournament, like the fans that come there and they'll look at it yeah. different. And when I explained that to you, you were like, I never thought about that because when you hear someone say they don't want to do an interview, you don't ever think, well, maybe he's got another problem he's dealing with, or maybe he's just like we're short right. on time, or whatever. Right. You he's always just, think the worst. Yeah, he's like he's really a dick. I mean, yeah. that guy. Is- <laughs> well, that's kind of what I said. I was like that Mullins. I tell you what, Bill Belichick a bass fishing. Yeah, <laughs> hey, well, funny. Bill freaking wins, bro. He's he, Bill Belichick ain't so bad. <laughs> no, he's he's a lot better than Mullins. So maybe, <laughs> I need to get on his skill. <laughs> Mullins, I do enjoy our conversations uh, every single time we talk, and I'm thankful that we did this. And I'm thankful I do this silly little podcast because it forced us to spend an hour and ten minutes and 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 be honest to each other. You think Hamner knows who Ozzy is now? No, no, yeah, he has to know Ozzy, doesn't he? Like, who doesn't <laughs> know Ozzy? I guess that was so funny though. But He's a funny, funny dude, though. Funny when it funny. comes out to Ozzy. Never fig- picture Fritz coming out to Ozzy. No, and and I I had wondered that forever. Like, did you pick this song? Yeah. Um, but he's like Fritz says, everyone likes Ozzy. Deep down, everybody's Ozzy fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bro. All right, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And hey, you do you think David Fritz would answer your phone if you called him right now? If I had his number. You don't have his number? Oh, my. I, have his number. I haven't gone into that stalker mode. Gonna, I was going to do something cool and get you to call him and ask him to be on the podcast. But as usual, I tried to do something cool, and I pushed it too far. I should have just said goodbye a minute ago. Bye, Look, Mullins. You can get him on. <laughs> so that was a fun one. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. And um, that's all I got for you this week. Once again, T's and P's with Ray Scott, his entire family, and everybody that loved Ray Scott. And um, very few closer with him than my man Bob Cobb. And I did talk to him this week. Bob Cobb's doing good, obviously hurting like everyone else. But, uh, man, what an amazing, amazing legacy Ray and Bob Cobb. I've created and uh, thankful to call them both friends. So um, with that in mind, take it away, Uncle Bob. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?